Hey, all Scott here. On average, how much do you think these interviews are worth to you? Of course, I've never charged for my archives in a dozen years of doing this, and I'm not about to start. But at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show, you can name your own price to help support and make sure there's still new interviews to give away. So what do you think? Two bits? A buck and a half? There are usually about 80 interviews per month, I guess, so take that into account. You can also cap the amount you'd be willing to spend in case things get out of hand around here. That's patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. And thanks, y'all. All right, y'all, Scott Horton Show. Check out the archives at libertarianinstitute.org slash Scott Horton Show. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Introducing James Carden. He is a contributing writer at The Nation and the executive editor for the American Committee for East-West Accords website, eastwestaccord.com. And he's got a great one here in The Nation called Obama's Foreign Policy, a hostage to bipartisan consensus. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, James? I'm all right. Thanks for having me. Uh, Very good to have you here. And, you know, it's funny. um, I remember back in 2008 or 9 or right around then, I interviewed Katrina Vanden Heuvel and um, her point was she was really worried about everything Obama was saying about how his foreign policy was going to be and that he's going to basically destroy himself in a Lyndon Baines Johnson kind of a way, bogging down and ruining his legacy uh, with uh, irresponsible foreign wars. And it seems like that pretty much played out, except for the part of people objecting to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I mean, I, uh, nobody else a, really cared. Right, a, a plus to my boss for uh, prescience, yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's, he's not quite at Johnson uh, uh, le- levels, but, um, you know, it's been a very, very discouraging eight years um, for a lot of us who thought that... Um, uh, Mr. Obama would kind of um, break with the past and um, uh, break away from the, you know, the the era of George W. Bush overreach. Um, it doesn't seem to to have happened. Uh, we're currently bombing. I think that we're up to bombing seven countries at the moment. Uh, we're tied back down in Iraq. Uh, there are ten thousand troops in Afghanistan. Um, so the uh, much uh, hoped for hoped for uh, change. Uh, foreign policy um, uh, hasn't come about. Um, and I think that, um, unfortunately, uh, if the polls can be believed, um, Mrs. Clinton will be uh, our next president. And um, I think that uh, we're going to head right back into George W. Bush territory. Uh, they've made no secret, her campaign and her surrogates have made no secret of the fact that she favors a far more robust um, foreign policy um, than Mr. Obama, and they have criticized him for his reticence um, regarding uh, Syria and regarding uh, Ukraine. Um, and they seem to have made, learned no lessons um, over uh, the, the the debacle in Iraq and uh, and in Libya. So um, buckle in, folks. Yeah. Well, and you know, here's one that nobody's talked about this entire campaign long. Afghanistan, where the 15-year war is still going on, and we still got almost 10,000 troops and probably 40 or who knows how many mercs and other contractors over there, plus the CIA and the drone force and all of that. And they lost the war. I mean, the Taliban are coming right back. So Hillary's choice, assuming it's Hillary or Trump, too, he said stay in Afghanistan forever, his only comment on the subject. Um all they can do is surge again, right? What are they going to do? Declare defeat and leave? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the, um, I like that you you brought up the word surge because uh, Clinton seems to be uh, enthralled to this notion that the um, that the the Petraeus um, crystal surge um, at the end of the Bush administration in two thousand seven was some sort of wondrous success, um, and so she. Um, she seems to believe that you know a surge is uh, is the answer to almost any problem. You you may recall in the aftermath of the uh, Orlando uh, shootings, uh, she called for a um, an intelligence gathering surge. So I think that um, the Clinton foreign policy is going to be characterized by uh, ramp ups in in a lot of different countries around the world, um, and they'll camouflage it by calling it a surge and. Um, you know, trying to remind the American people of what a what a terrific success the first surge was. So, of course, we should we should keep on going, uh, keep on going in that vein. Yep. Well, you know, um, 
I don't know if you know. I've been writing a book about uh, the terror war, and so far I'm still stuck on Afghanistan, just like the actual war. It's a quagmire, I tell you. Um, (laughs) And, uh, I mean, the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life, I think, is I read Obama's Wars by Bob Woodward. And, uh, boy, I would kill for one of those about the Syria policy right now. I swear to God I would. Um, But but the story of how they came to do the surge in Afghanistan is purely a story of Obama's cowardice, moral cowardice, and, and, you know, willingness to just bend right over to his subordinates and do whatever they said when he could have absolutely shouted, not just uh, Petraeus. I mean, the better way to do it would have been to frame it as just attacking McCain and saying, look, McCain lost this election. I'm the one who won because the American people didn't want him deciding our foreign policy. So he can sit in the Senate and cry all he wants. No, we're not doing this stupid surge. It's never going to work. To build a Tajik army to rule the Pashtuns forever? No. And then he could have just said no and been brave and faced down his Republican and military opponents. But instead... He was brave by surging and doubling the war that he knew he was bound to lose. And yet it seems like, James, that he made the correct political decision there. Because if he had quit the war, they would have attacked him mercilessly and he might have lost 2012. But in doubling the war, he satisfied the Republicans and the liberal Democrats didn't mind at all because it was Obama's war. So they just averted their eyes. So it was actually probably his best reelection strategy was to double the Afghan war back then. I yeah. don't know what else. Cause, cause if you read about the decision-making, it's clear that he knew better by far to do this. You know, he had James Cartwright, uh, the general come up with these different options that uh, McChrystal and Petraeus were refusing to give him and that kind of thing. He, he knew better and then he did it anyway. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a terrible black mark on his presidency. Um, you know, it's also a story of a president being railroaded by his own by his own government. Um, the options that uh, he requested were uh, basically um, basically ignored by Robert Gates, and, as you say, uh, the the, um, the Joint Chiefs. Um, they narrowed the available options down to, you know. Um, you know, give a, I think McChrystal wanted forty thousand, and um, they finally settled on uh, thirty-three thousand with a seven thousand contingent from NATO. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, and of course, what followed um, the surge was um, a, an uptick in um, in in um, casualties. There, there have been more casualties in Afghanistan under Obama than there were. Um, under George W. Bush. I mean, there were a spate of what they call blue on green attacks, um, which, uh, you know, as you and I'm sure your listeners know, uh, were, you know, the spate of attacks in um, 2010-11 by our purported allies in Afghanistan uh, killing American American servicemen. Um, so uh, that was a, a terrible decision, but it just set the stage for... Um, a couple of other pretty terrible decisions that that he made um, going forward, uh, including Libya and including those two parallel and dangerously misconceived um, interventions uh, in Syria. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, poor Yemen and Somalia get overlooked, too. But, you know, you mentioned seven countries were bombing. Those are two of them. And, of course, you know, uh, both wars, especially Somalia, inherited from the Bush years. But Obama is really responsible in large measure for escalating the two different wars that we're waging in uh, Yemen right now, one for al-Qaeda and one against him. Well, we have that habit of, of, of funding both sides. We're doing that. We're doing we see that we're doing that in, in Syria as well. Um, the CIA was funding. Um, one, one group of uh, opposition uh, to uh, Assad and the Pentagon and other, and then they ended up fighting um, fighting one another. Um, you know, we just never seem to have learned the lessons um, that of of Iraq. Uh, there's a lot of complaint in Washington that the the, the lesson has been overlearned, but I'm not really sure that's true. I don't think anything has been learned um, going by going by the record of the the Obama administration. Yeah. You know, I saw a thing. I mean, I don't put much stock in this. Don't get me wrong. It's just politics and all that. But um, uh, Michael Tracy, uh, the writer for Vice magazine, tweeted out a quote yesterday 
And as Tracy pointed out, I think quite correctly, TV news never highlights these quotes. But it's Donald Trump going back to where he was about a year ago, saying we should have never intervened over in the Middle East at all. And if we'd never gone over there 25 years ago, everything would be way better for everybody. And look how they screwed up Iraq. They screwed up Libya. They screwed up Syria. And, you know, we need a change in thinking in Washington, D.C. and this kind of thing. And, you know, that's pretty good. It's not just... I mean, sometimes he says, well, the only problem is we should have stayed in Iraq forever, you know. But then sometimes he says these things, you know, and sounds more like you and me. Like, hey, why are we intervening over there at all? Why do we care if Saddam rules Kuwait or not? These kind of questions. Um, and, and they don't ever highlight that. But I think that's a big part of, uh, of you know, his appeal to people. We saw this. At first it was a surprise, but it shouldn't have been a surprise that after taking on the Iraq War and George W. Bush's legacy in South Carolina, he won with an almost majority out of 15 people in the race or something like that. After attacking the war in no uncertain terms, and it was because, hey, that was their kids that died in that thing and who now look at it and realize that it really was all for nothing after all and that kind of thing. And and. It's too bad that TV doesn't pick up on that narrative that even though, I mean, I don't even really think it's right, but, you know, that, that Trump is any kind of dove, but that he, he positions himself as a dove compared to Hillary, at least, and that that's yeah. part of his appeal to the masses that do go for him. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. I think that this, this election should have been uh, easily won by the Republicans, um, but he can't really seem to get out of his way. Um, if he had stuck to kind of the two core planks uh, on which he ran in the Republican primary, that of um, a- a- opposition to free trade agreements and anti-military intervention, um, and he-, he was able to sort of avoid all the ugliness uh, that some of his um, so <laughs> you know some of his comments um, have been uh, not so not so wise. I think he'd be he'd be winning quite handily, um, but he is a very very flawed messenger. My my fear is is that he um, by his association with um, with ideas of um, military you know anti intervention that he he uh, hopefully he is not but he may have you know poisoned them by association. I hope that's not the case, but I can't help but wonder if someone like Rand Paul won the primary, how far he'd be ahead. At the moment, um, because there is a outside the beltway, at least um, there uh, is an exhaustion with um, our endless um, interventions abroad. Yeah. Well, Rand has certainly done much better since dropping out of the presidential race and going back to the Senate where he's tried to oppose arms sales to Saudis in the name of the war for Al Qaeda in Yemen against the Houthis and all that. And I even heard him say on TV, um, which make this makes him a thousand percent better than any senator on this issue, where he said, hey, imagine the future here for just a second. If we do drive the Houthis out of power in sauna, Al-Qaeda might be next. It's, there's no guarantee that the Saudi choice of hottie is going to be the president. We don't know what's going to happen over there. So, he, you know, he didn't have the courage to sound like that in the primaries at all, or maybe he would have beat Donald Trump. Said he ran as Jeb Bush and got crushed. So, yeah, so, too bad for him. You know, and it, us. It, it's, it's not a it's not a happy future that we're looking at uh, either way. Right. But I, I I don't suspect that even with all the, the events of the past week that uh, it's possible for him to uh, to to pull it out. Uh, I'm not even sure really if it, 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 I'm not even sure it would be desirable. Oh no. He seems, he seems to me to be. A bit of an unhinged uh, character. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think they're both worse than each other. I yeah. don't. Yeah, I don't know why anybody feels like they have to commit to either or even lean one way or the other. Yeah, yeah there's a there's an old Russian expression you may have heard. Uh, both are worse. Yeah. Oh, is that a Russian thing? I thought yeah. I had coined that myself, but okay. <laughs> I, I'll have my wife translate it into Russian for me. Um, yeah. Now, so uh, hey, I wonder if you saw this thing yesterday. Uh, that it came out in, I guess, the latest batch of emails. I can't keep track, but it was in some of the Podesta emails where all of uh, Hillary's staff were conspiring to come up with the proper spin during the Benghazi hearings. Not so much on the Benghazi attack itself, but on the question 
based on the false premise that the Republicans are going to attack us for what a terrible catastrophe the Libya war has turned out to be overall. And when they do that, here are the talking points for blaming it on the Libyans for not taking advantage of the wonderful opportunity we've given them and, and, and you know, these other things. And then the joke, of course, being that the Republicans never brought up any of that because the Libya war was their war, too. They demanded it. And so they refused to broaden out their questioning beyond the lack of security and the lack of rescue on September 11, 2012 at the Benghazi makeshift consulate thingamajig. Uh, and... And it completely excludes all other questions of the Libya war. And so they got off yeah. easy there. She never was called to account for completely destroying the center of North Africa. Right. And one of the biggest missed opportunities um, at those hearings was um, instead of the focus on, and there were legitimate questions there, I believe, of the lack of security, um, what Sure. They could have been asking is why on earth um, the ambassador was there in the first place. I think that there are some pretty serious unanswered uh, questions as to um, whether or not the United States was running um, arms from Libya into Syria. Um, and uh, that will be an interesting um, – that will be interesting if anyone is able to um, ever – ever get a hold, ever get, you know, a hold of that story. Um, it, it seems to me that there is a far bigger scandal uh, than, the, than the than the lack of security, mm. not to downplay that. Hey, that's a um, perjury it, charge, too, because, again, Rand it, Paul called her out on that in front of the Senate, correct. and she denied all knowledge and was clearly lying. I mean, we have the, um, I mean, we have reporting by Seymour Hirsch, but we also have the documents from judicial watch lawsuit that uh, yeah. judge napolitano has written up about the qataris are running the guns and the cia supervising the whole thing yeah i mean and then of course there's the larger geopolitical question as to whether or not um we should have been pushing for a no no fly zone over libya whether the overthrow of Gaddafi w- was actually in our in our national interests whether or not um the are very hyped up media reports that um, Gaddafi was about to unleash a ma- you know, wholesale massacre uh, on the um, civilian population in the Gazi. I mean, all of that actually was pretty well known at the time that that was not uh, what he was going to do. And they knew that, that, that he was not going to do that because he didn't do that in the other cities uh, <laughs> that, that they, um, that they eventually, um, that the government actually won, you know, won back. Um, and so there's the false premise of the of the Libyan uh, catastrophe, which um, people um, are still pushing. And uh, you know, and I think the other thing that we should one of the fallout, one of the most important um, uh, pieces of fallout um, of the Libyan um, disaster was that it really was the beginning of the end of the very brief detente between the United States and Russia, because um, Russia, um, at the time, um, Medvedev was president. Wait, hold that and, thought for just a second, because yeah. I, I was just about to ask you about that, but I want to I stick to Libya for just a moment here mm-hmm. to bring up this quote of Hillary. Well, there's a couple of very important ones. Um, the, it was uh, from the debate where... When she was finally confronted with this, she said, well, it was Obama's fault. It wasn't my war. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just, just Secretary of State, and Obama's the one who called the shot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it was a good one. But, uh, yeah, no, it was, look at him, not me, which is true. But then again, she made him do it, and we all know that. And, and she crowed about it at the time uh, mm-hmm. during her mission accomplished moment and all that. But she – one of the, the, the quote here – and this is just a perfect um, exemplary statement of Hillary Clinton's mindset, I think, uh, James – where she says, yes, we did try without success because of the Libyans' obstruction to our efforts, but we did try and we will continue to try to help the Libyan people. And then the, that goes to the other quote, and everybody can find this at realclearpolitics.com, and it's Clinton defends ongoing anarchy in Libya by saying, hey, we're still in Korea, we're still in Germany. In other words, yeah. the first thing she's going to do when she's president is invade Libya and garrison the place and stay forever. Because, hey, their obstruction to our efforts uh, has made it where her wonderful war hasn't quite worked out, so now she's going to fix it by tripling down. Yeah, it makes sense. 
I mean, it's really worked out. It's really worked out so well in, uh, in all the other places that we've tried it. I, I find it amusing that um, she would use Germany and and uh, and the Korean uh, DMZ zone as some sort of uh, rational justification for intervening in, in in Libya in the civil war that we uh, have had absolutely no interest in intervening in. Uh, we also don't have any, and this is sort of a parallel between Libya and, and, and what's going on in Syria, it really is not in our interest to overthrow um, these rather sinister but secular um, leaders, because what replaces them are the worst kind of radical uh, Islamist uh, fundamentalists. And, so, and we provide, when we overthrow these secular regimes, we provide safe haven for the likes of ISIS and the al Nusra Front. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these are these are horribly misconceived ideas that um, that if we overthrow, say, Assad, that the um, peaceful um, pro-democracy liberals in uh, Syria, um, all twenty of them, I guess, are going to um, you know uh, take over the reins of power um, in Syria and give us a government. Um, I guess, like Adenauer's uh, Germany. I mean, it's just, you know, it's laughable on its face. I love Bitcoin, but there's just something incredibly satisfying about having real, fine silver in your pocket. That's why commodity disks are so neat. They're one-ounce rounds of fine silver with a QR code on the back. Just grab your smartphone's QR reader, scan the coin, and you'll instantly get the silver spot price in Federal Reserve Notes and Bitcoin. And if you donate 100 bucks to The Scott Horton Show, he'll send you one. Learn more at Facebook.com slash Commodity Discs. CommodityDiscs.com. Yeah. Well, you know, it reminds me of uh, the quote from Hosni Mubarak back in 2002, or maybe three, when he said, our, our sock puppet fascist secular dictator in Egypt said, hey, if you do this and invade Iraq, you're going to create 10,000 bin Ladens. And then that's exactly what happened. And then Obama took the side of the 10,000 bin Ladens in Libya and Syria. And that's the confounding part, is when George W. Bush created Jihadistan in all of Western Iraq, it was because he was a stupid idiot. It was a, a horrible effect uh, of the war, but it was not what he was trying to do in the first place. But Obama has outright sided with him. <laughs> you know, back to Hirsch and that Ratline article, wow, these Al-Qaeda guys are great in Libya, let's move them on to Syria then. <laughs> this is, this is easy and fun. Right. I love how, like, you know, Mubarak, Clinton, I believe, wrote this in, in her memoir. She considered uh, the Mubaraks very good friends. Um, <laughs> I love how, um, you know, we would just ignore, um, you know, that warning from Mubarak. Why is it that we think we have a better um, grasp of, of what's going on in the Middle East than someone like Hosni Mubarak. I mean, it, you know, it's just, it's incredible, but we're, we're blinded by um, this um, pro-democratization ideology um, that both parties, both major parties share it. Um, and it's, you know, at court, it's what's called democratic peace theory, right? Uh, the, the myth that um, pro-democracy movements are naturally in our interest because other, democrac other democracies don't fight each other. Uh, so, um, hey, so that's why we throw our support um, or why we say we throw our support behind um, all these all these disparate sort of um, uh, pro-democracy uh, movements that end up ushering in regimes that are completely inimical to uh, U.S. national security interests. So that and that's it. That just doesn't happen in the Middle East, by the way. It also happened uh, uh, two years ago in a country called Ukraine. Yeah. All right. So here, let me give you a segue to that back where I interrupted you from. Uh, people might remember 2011. Putin was what the prime minister for a while and the president was, I assume, I really don't know very much about him, but it was a Putin protege, Medvedev. Yeah. And uh -huh. It was Hillary went over and had the big reset button that they, they had the translation wrong and everything. But they said, let's reset and let's be friends and let's get along. And then she influenced him and convinced him uh, to support the U.N. resolution for the no-fly zone over Libya. 
And then, right. as you said, it was a bait and switch, and it was for regime change anyway. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever explained to me why the Russians cared, or whether, I mean, surely they must have known it was going to be a bait and switch for regime change in Tripoli in the first place anyway. But you're saying that really burned their hide that uh, they got tricked on that U.N. resolution? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly burned Putin's. And I think that that certainly sort of soured the relationship um, between him and, him and his protege. And I, I, I have a feeling, oh, I don't know, that that, that was one of the, 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 the reasons or one of the things that convinced him to, to retake the reins. Um, because um, Medvedev was a very enthusiastic partner um, of, of, the, of the United States and, and, and of the West. And he and Obama actually got on quite Quite famously, I was actually in uh, the White House in 20, 2010. Um, a friend of mine worked there, and we were walking down the hall, and there was a picture of Obama and Medvedev. Um, and this guy out of nowhere just pointed, pointed at the picture, and he said to me, um, Obama loves this guy. And they so they had a real rapport. And I think that... Um, you know, I think it was sort of um, mutual in a way. But once the uh, once you know Putin correctly foresaw what was going to happen that the no-fly zone wasn't really a no-fly zone. Uh, it was you know a mechanism for regime change. And once that happened, um, that was it. And uh, that we burnt a, um, we lost a lot of trust um, uh, uh, there between the United States and, and Russia when that happened. All right, and now, um, you know, I'm always curious about what happened with that coup in Ukraine because, uh, you know, obviously we have in the the leaked plot uh, to do it, uh, Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey Pyatt, the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and the Ambassador to Ukraine, and they say, you know what, we're going to get, she says, uh, Nuland says, yeah, we're going to get Joe Biden to come in here, the Vice President, he's the one who's going to, you know, put it all through him and this guy uh, working for the U.N. We're going to go around the Germans because they're taking too long. And we're going to go ahead and glue this thing and midwife it and all this, that and the other thing. So that makes it sound like a real special project of the White House if the vice president is helping run the operation and all this kind of thing. And yet Obama's done a pretty good job of portraying himself as almost an innocent bystander in this. That, oh, gee, look what the State Department did. And... And then when it came down to the war that he caused there, he backed off. And where Strobe Talbot and all the people who were responsible for NATO expansion in the first place were saying, now we have to triple down and arm up the Ukrainian government in their war with uh, the uh, Eastern Ukrainian separatists and, I guess, you know, Russian special forces backing them there. And Obama backed down. Thank God. Uh, he went out like Bush did in, in Georgia in 2008. And and spared us a worse war with Russia. But so I wonder just what's even going on there. Is this guy even in control of his government or he would prefer us to think that he's not, but he's really just as bad as any of these people? No, I don't think that he's um, I, I think it's pretty well known that he simply isn't that interested in Europe. Um, so I think that he's surrounded by uh, pretty, pretty bad, pretty bad advisors. And I think that he probably just went on faith that um, what they were telling him that, you know, this was uh, this was good for American interest, um, you know, and everything would work out fine and um, we should support this coup. Uh, and he went along with it until um, it was too late. And then it became quite obvious um, that the um, people that we have empowered um, are uh, almost immediately began um as they say it uh, with Assad, uh, w killing their own people. They started waging war on their own people. They, we don't phrase it like that when it comes to Ukraine, right? It's a Russian invasion, right? It's um, pro-Russian separatists. But what is really happening is that Kiev is waging a war on the Russian-speaking population in the East. Um, because they're perceived to be, in some cases they are, um, you know, um, pro-Russian and anti, anti-Maidan. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Obama seems to be somewhat oddly aloof from his, from his own, from his own foreign policy apparatus. Um, but that could very well be because he learned early on, as we were talking about. Um, in Af with Afghanistan, that um, maybe 
he knows it's a fight that he can't win. And he's going to get railroaded anyway. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's just so easy to imagine, isn't it? If you're the president saying no to these people, <laughs> I don't know. And he, and he talks about them as though he's separate from them. Yeah, this darn blob that's always trying to tell me what to do. But, boy, he sure does do what they say a lot. <laughs> that's true. I, I mean, I, I, give him, I give him points for, for recognizing that, that there is such a thing. Um, the, the, the blob surely does exist. Uh, and it's, uh, it's bipartisan. Um, it, 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 it controls... It is in control of all the major media uh, outlets, the cable television outlets, even purportedly, you know, so-called uh, progressive um, channels like MSNBC. They're all on the same page, and it's all about, um, you know, America uh, has to be the policeman of the world. Uh, we can intervene anywhere and anywhere um, for the sake of democracy, Scott. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Well, and speaking of which, I think these are probably, you know, two of the biggest uh, developments that go most, you know, sort of unremarked upon. And that is the pivot to Asia, which was really one of, uh, you know, aside from the Libya war, was Hillary's big accomplishment as secretary of state. She wrote that big thing or had written for her that big thing in foreign policy. Um, the, there's the whole Navy, Air Force, Air Sea battle plan for China and all this. And then. As Nick Terse has instructed us, the Army is jealous because I guess the Marines sort of have a role with the air-sea battle. But where's the, what's the Army supposed to do when we're at war with China? Well, they're going to just occupy Africa, <laughs> starting oh, cool. with the Special Forces and the, the Joint Special Operations Command and then following up with General Infantry being stationed all over the continent and just looking for things to do. And... You know, yeah, they sure don't seem wrong. to have trouble finding many. <laughs> right. No, that sounds like a plan. Um, you know, one of the things I, you know, was sorry because I ran out of room, but one of the things that I sort of neglected in my in my overview or aut- autopsy of the Obama foreign policy was the was this pivot to China. It was actually in large part the brainchild of um, former Senator Jim Webbs. Um, and Webb um, had shown, I I think um, some really good instincts on foreign policy, but uh, here I'm not so sure. Um, you know, this is basically containment 2.0 for the Asia Pacific, um, and I, I think that we're in the process of um, sort of shifting the ground of the U.S.-China relationship from finance and, and business and import-export uh, to rallying what are called bandwagoning states, you know, the smaller states on the periphery of China, to contain them. And I, I find it very puzzling when very serious foreign policy analysts say that we have uh, core national interests in the South China Sea, and that these islands that you know, China is you know, in, the, in the process of constructing, that this poses a, a grave threat to U.S. national security interests. I'm not sure I understand that, um, and maybe maybe you do. Um, but to 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 uh, think that we can um, wage uh, another um, uh, policy of containment, uh, which means a militarized, you know, relationship, not relationship, adversarial uh, relationship with China, uh, given that we are overstretched as it is, seems to me the height of uh, the height of folly. But um, and if we were to do that, it would be a good idea if we were to really be serious about containing China. There's a country in that area that might be that we might recruit to that the cause. Uh, a country that has, shares a rather sizable border with them that has actually fought um, a land war with them as recently as 1968. Uh, that country is Russia. But what we're doing is alienating both Russia and China at the same time. Uh, it, it seems to me to be um, a brilliant strategy, uh, and it's it's a strategy that um, Obama has uh, has been pursuing. Yeah, I mean, uh, it reminds me of Chalmers Johnson talking about uh, back in the George W. Bush years when the Europeans started making all these arms deals with the Chinese and right when the Russians were signing the big red treaty and all that, where 
hey, look, it's that Berlin, Moscow, Beijing axis that was always the absolute worst nightmare of American policymakers during the Cold War. And it's George W. Bush who's accomplishing all of it for them and pushing them all together again to the you know, supposed de- detriment of the interests of the U.S., although we're defining the U.S. here, I think, just as the American empire, not the American people, because I don't know what we have to lose uh, by any of that. But um, or, or gain. Yeah, I mean. I mean, yeah, you know, um, you, you brought up the reason why. Who cares about these rocks in the South China Sea? And the answer, of course, is it's the same reason that they hate Cuba and the same reason they hate Iran. It's just the precedent set. Nobody's allowed to tell Uncle Sam no about anything ever or there will be some hell to pay. You know, maybe we don't want to get in a nuclear war with China, hopefully, over this stuff. But we'll hurt them somehow because you're just not allowed to say no to the USA. That's it. You know? Even that though Cuba, be, I mean, what threat to America is Cuba for crying out loud? You know, uh, I'm surprised, really, at the. the um, uh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, that's a bit naive, maybe, but I'm surprised at the depths of anger over the opening to, to Cuba. Um, you know, p- people are really uh, people are really invested for for whatever reason um, in. Uh, painting Cuba as um, as some sort of um, American adversary, um, I don't know. It's um, it's a strange state of affairs, but I, I have a feeling that um, things are only going to get worse. Yeah, afraid so. I think you know. <laughs> I've even seen uh, Obama hating Republicans, and I don't just mean never Trump neocons either, but. Uh, just plain old kind of right wing rank and file types musing that, you know, geez, whatever happens, it's going to be worse than Obama starting next year. There's basically no way around it. This whole thing is just a catastrophe. It's too late for anything different to be done, too. Yeah. So, no, I, so I, I good think luck that, to us. <laughs> well, what, you know, what can, you know, what can be done? I mean, I sus- if if all of the, if our predictions of what Hillary is about to to bring forth are correct, I think that um, it would probably be a very good idea for um, libertarian supporters of Rand Paul to start to start yesterday on on his 2020 bid, uh, and I think it would be a very good idea for. Um, for the Democrats to find an uh, an alternative to Sanders, but someone who, um, you know, preaches um, a uh, anti-interventionist uh, foreign policy, uh, and and to begin and to begin working uh, for uh, you know for a cha- to challenge her in, in four years, um, I don't think that any time uh, can be wasted. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised, but I don't think so. Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're uh, certainly uh, right on with the uh, transpartisan alliance and that kind of thing. And um, I'm only just getting started to see if I can try to help with this thing. But I want to try to get uh, as many groups as I know are members of to try to uh, get in with this. And, hey, you've got a really great group there, the East-West Accord, uh, the Committee for East-West Accord. And this is a thing that David Swanson is putting together. Tell the next president no more war. And it's at rootsaction.org. And he's trying to put together a coalition of groups to tell Hillary or Trump, you know, whoever they are, whether it's Syria, Ukraine or anywhere else, the answer is no. We absolutely are against any escalation anywhere and want the troops home and that kind of thing. And I think it's a a brief enough statement that there's not much to argue with there. So um, maybe I'll get back with you, James, about seeing if we can get the committee to sign up. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, efforts, grassroots, um, you know, efforts like that are, uh, you know, uh, are, uh, are are extremely, are extremely important. It's, and it's hard work. I mean, uh, you know, the, the Committee on East West Accord has a uh, former defense secretary, former presidential candidate and senator and um, some distinguished ambassadors. Um, but um, I tell you that it's not easy getting a hearing. It's it's not easy finding people um, who will who will speak out uh, um, or even or even host um, you know discussions. Uh, so it's very uh, it's a very alarming uh, state of state of affairs. I mean these are not um, fringe voices. I think you'll agree um, at all. And um, it's it's t- it's tough going. 
Uh, and it's largely because, uh, as Ob- you know, as Obama termed it, the blob uh, or the Washington playbook is uh, is in such control. Yep, afraid so. All right, well, I'll let you go. Uh, I sure appreciate you coming back on the show, James, as always. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I certainly will get back with you in terms of uh, seeing if we can get the committee signed up for this thing, too. Okay. All right, appreciate it. Have a good one. Take care. All right, so that's James Carden. He's at The Nation magazine and the Committee for East-West Accord. This one is called Obama's Foreign Policy, a Hostage to Bipartisan Consensus. And uh, that's at thenation.com. Check out the archives of this show at the Libertarian Institute. That's libertarianinstitute.org slash Scott Horton Show. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, I'll Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out TheBumperSticker.com at TheBumperSticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink, so you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old-style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold TheBumperSticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it, and there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me, too. Let TheBumperSticker.com help you get the word out. That's TheBumperSticker.com at TheBumperSticker.com. You drink coffee, I drink coffee, just about everyone drinks coffee. So why bother with anything but the best? Darren's Coffee is roasted at his new shop in Claremont, Indiana. And coming soon, you can order on Amazon and support the show by using Scott Horton's affiliate link. Darren'sCoffee.com Because everyone deserves to drink great coffee.